Welcome everyone to a new episode of the LSG2G podcast. Um, our topic today is entrepreneurship and why you don't need to quit your job to become an entrepreneur. People start your businesses for a number of reasons, but that initial excitement can often turn into stress quickly. And while more information is actually available out there on the internet today that building a profitable company from scratch actually takes a lot of time and hard work, still impact on mental health is underreported. But does entrepreneurship actually always have to be like that? This is what we'll be exploring today with our guest Issa Saulet, uh, or whom I commonly often refer to as Wizard of Marketing. Issa is Chief Growth Officer at Symptoma and has previously co-founded several startups out of Oxford University, where he meanwhile acts as a startup mentor. Welcome, Issa. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm really honored that you asked me to be on this webinar slash podcast. So um, <laughs> excited to talk about entrepreneurship, really. Uh, my journey, as well as, um, as, as the description uh, put so well, basically challenging the archetype of what an entrepreneur is and hopefully encouraging others along the way to try joining in on that journey. Awesome. Issa, you have spent a considerable amount of your career as co-founder of startups. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and the ups and downs that you've encountered there? Um, sure. Um, so lots of ups and downs, as you put it. I Okay, so... I'll just give you a bit about my background. So I'm originally from Pakistan. Then I studied and worked in Kuala Lumpur for a while, after which I ended up going to Oxford to start my first startup. I think my first startup or idea at least was when I was 16, which was uh, essentially my mom kept getting a new phone from my sister because my sister got a good job and would treat my mom and like uh, basically try and get her love by buying her nice things. And the problem was my mom didn't know how to use some of the tech on it. She did some, not some, the other part. So uh, we had this situation where my mom was constantly asking, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? So I wanted to start a tutoring service to teach more senior citizens how to actually use the tech that their kids are getting them. Ended up getting an offer for funding back then for, I think, 60,000 rupees at the time, which is like 300 euros. But as a 16 year old, that whole thing was terrifying. Uh, didn't really get into it. <laughs> but then when I was in university, after graduating, I worked in a digital agency. And while in university, I got a bit bored with my degree, which was in business economics and management. So I ended up finding any books I could online uh, and downloading like one year syllabus of, of my own, which talked about marketing and startups, including at the time books from Gary Vaynerchuk and a lot of others. And uh, YC particularly stood out, so Y Combinator. And what I ended up doing was after uni, because of some pressures, I ended up alongside my full-time full -time job starting a little, little project called Polymath KL that was uh, basically an online tutoring service, like technology-aided tutoring, uh, which was pretty cool. And uh, I also started a film production company. I was doing uh, freelance social media work. And what ended up happening was that the last project I was working on, Starticles, which was an online education sort of ecosystem, ended up getting the attention of the University of Oxford Software Incubator, uh, who invited me over to the UK with a modest amount of funding and invited me to, there to actually work on it. Um, what ended up happening is uh, as, as per sort of the standard journey for a lot of people, six months down the line, unfortunately, that original startup didn't work out. And I think in retrospect, that was one of the first, going to Oxford was one of the first highs. Uh, I remember having to sort of battle my internal imposter syndrome, like, oh, really? I'm just like some random nobody from Karachi. Why did they call me? And um, there were a lot of things that aligned to get through, but it was my first proper, proper startup. 
And what ended up happening was that I think I and the team had a lot of those early bumps in the road that we needed to counter. Uh, my two co-founders at the time had full-time commitments. So I was working full-time on that, which was quite hard and sometimes even demotivating. Uh, but essentially, I don't think I can point out one particularly particular thing that went wrong there. But um, after that, while that didn't work out, fortunately, I was helping a bunch of people because as you will hear in a minute, I really, I think my personal motto is build things and help people. Um, so I was helping a couple of other companies for fun. Uh, some of them progressed into consulting opportunities and um, some of them progressed to, one of them in particular progressed to me co-founding a startup called Esplorio uh, that I do think of as some of the most difficult yet fun years of my life. And um, just to put it into context, when I first came to the UK, I had, <laughs> I think I had my like life savings from working a little bit in Malaysia. And I came here with like 500 pounds, sorry, 1500 pounds to last six months, which is a bit of a joke in Oxford. And I was thinking, hopefully I'll figure it out. And essentially, even when I was in, before and even when I was at Esplorio, there were times where I would, my friends would joke because I would basically go and buy like, do you know when uh, in supermarkets, and I don't know what it's like in Austria, in supermarkets, when a product is close to its best before date, they discount the price. So I would mainly look for those because I didn't have money. And I was always like, oh, will, will I make rent in three days? But I, I it was sort of that mentality that was actually a good thing as well, because it made you just think about the bare minimum you need to do. Sorry, not the bare minimum, like the things that were, that you could do and basically bootstrap and be scrappy. So ended up uh, joining Esplorio and things um, started trending upwards, which was really nice. I had a wonderful team and I, um, as we grew, and I think as we reached our, got our first round of funding, which was relatively modest, we went on to raise some, I think over a million dollars later, further down the line. But as things got better, I went from sleeping on sofas for, for friends uh, to actually, oh, I can rent out a room. And I went through this sort of journey in which I think a lot of early stage founders will be able to relate to, which is a roller coaster in terms of ups and downs. Uh, there were times where money was tight, even as even when you have some funding, because early entrepreneurs don't necessarily just get million and millions off the bat. I remember one time my co-founder uh, telling me that I need to get shoes because my two current ones, my, my one pair had like two holes in it that used to suck up the water while I walked. And I was like, new shoes, they're like 40 pounds. Who would pay 40 pounds for shoes? Uh, and then, yeah, it was interesting because I think we first raised something like 150,000, which coming from a very different background was like, oh my God, 150,000, that is so much money. And then eventually what happened is I realized, oh, that's very little money. And that goes away really quickly. So I think it was interesting trying to figure out how to balance a lot of things. I think, I, I think that could be several podcasts on its own in terms of what uh, the lessons were, what the mistakes were, what the things uh, were that I wish we did better or what the things are that I think we did very well. So for example, it was a super fun but difficult market, travel, as anyone would put it. And essentially, it was a travel app that helped record and share your trips. Can I actually ask, so what did you keep you motivated during that time? Because you sort of uh, experienced this very classical uh, kind of tech startup life of sleeping on sofas or so, uh, everywhere, being very 
you know, cost effective when it comes to expenses? What did keep you motivated? Was it that you saw the promise of the big money at some point or was it really putting tech into practice? Uh, what was your motivation? What kept you alive then to really keep going? Um, existential crises. <laughs> Now, um, but basically in seriousness, what ended up happening was my background uh I am from, let's put it this way, I'm from a city or perhaps a, a, there was a time in my life that we were, was a, not a lot of security and there was a lot of danger. And um, essentially, I think a lot of people, depending on where the country, which country they're from, as well as what their family life was like or what their quality of life was, they, they sort of think of escaping, right? Um, So I remember in Pakistan, my opportunities were severely limited compared to other countries. So I wanted to go to some place that relative to my home country, um, where opportunities were merit-based, more merit-based. And I think part of me was, okay, I wanted to go and establish myself somewhere else. And I didn't want to be stuck there. Like, don't get me wrong, uh, it's a beautiful place and it has a lot going for it. But at the time of my life, uh, time of my youth, it wasn't the, the safest place, let's put it this way. So I think part of me was, um, the part of me that got me out was sort of, a, of escaping and not only changing my life, but also changing the life of my family members and helping them get out. Um, I think the other... <laughs> Um, the other thing was, oh, I like living in a room uh, or I like being able to pay rent. I remember there was a post online, like a meme saying, oh, why would you like to work here? And it's like, I'm very passionate about being able to afford rent and food. Um, so I think coming from the time where I went from thinking that 40 pounds for shoes are ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I think the thing that motivated me was just trying to keep my head above water. Um, so that was a fun thing. I, I, I can relate to that. I mean, I think still uh, today that uh, paying more than 40 pounds for shoes is ridiculous. <laughs> there are much better opportunities there to invest money in. Um, why? Well, I mean, many people, in, in, and that can relate to what you say, I mean, the situation of life. So when, when, when you need money, why did you not just go for a regular job, nine to five somewhere? I mean, it, we are talking from Austria, so it's the safe yeah. bet. And this is what most Austrian parents would uh, recommend to their kids. Go find a safe job in a bank or uh, in, with the government and don't try anything stupid like uh, founding a startup. What brought you, uh, what directed you towards the more risky way? It's a very, very good question. And I think, sadly, it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, it has a lot to do with the geographic lottery. So um, I think maybe if I was born in the UK or certain countries, and there's this really amazing show on Apple TV called Little America which tells the story of immigrants. And it's funny how there's a difference in whether you're an immigrant or expat based on whether you look more like the people from that country versus others. But for me, I remember someone asking me to stay in Pakistan and do a job that I did not want to do and hated. And it was essentially the equivalent of $125 a week, uh, a month. Uh, and Basically, there was, in the opportunities that I had considered back home, there was nothing for me. And unfortunately, with my green passport, although two weeks ago, I actually became a British citizen and now have a British passport, that passport is notoriously difficult to get out of the country with, in terms of not just like a holiday, but if you want to get a visa to move and live in a different country, it's ridiculously difficult. And um, essentially the reason 
I didn't go for a job in Pakistan is because I didn't actually feel that the opportunities available to me were the best uh, for me. And I actually felt like being in some place which is like a world hub where I could take advantage of opportunities based on, like I said, merit. So for me, and if I consider going abroad, to be honest, getting a job abroad was practically not a choice to the point that getting a job abroad was so hard that instead I started a startup and had to get invited to the Oxford University Software Incubator to get all of those things. And even then, um, God knows, I can't even remember how much I've spent on visas. It's been tens of thousands. So I think for me, the simple answer in retrospect could be summarized as there wasn't really a, a plan B. <laughs> there was one option that would be the most likely. It was very high risk and thanks to a lot of luck and support from the right people, I've managed to stumble my way into this position uh, where I am right now, but I think there wasn't anything underneath that threshold that I wanted. And like I said, I wanted to be in a situation where I could help my family immigrate. And thankfully, a lot of them are also uh, are, are now in Canada, where my other sister really helped with uh, that. And she pushed a lot of that. But for me, if you think about it, like if I was to get my family or my mom to the UK, I don't even know how long, how much it is right now. But I think to get like an investor visa, because my mom would probably not qualify for like a tech visa or something. It's like 2 million pounds investment. So for me to hit those goals, not because of my own personal goals, but to help my family, the costs were so high that I needed to do something that was huge. If that makes any sense. It's great. I mean, I guess there are worse places to land than Oxford <laughs> University. <laughs> yeah. Getting a, a taste of the ecosystem there. Um, so you're also a startup mentor at Oxford University Innovation or the startup incubator. So what are the kind of uh, common themes or co common issues that you see there uh, within startups? Um, so both in the in the the help I provide to entrepreneurs through the university as well as outside of it, because I do things outside of it as well. Um, there's a lot of things. I think um, one meta problem that I've found more times than not is that um, people aren't really, <laughs> people who ask for advice aren't always don't always want it or know its value when you share it. So I can tell someone, oh, there's a hole there when you're walking, J avoid the hole. 90% of people will walk into the hole because they're not at that position where they're understanding the value of the advice. So I think one of the most underrated bits of startup advice that I've ever heard is make something people want. People completely forget this. This is from Paul Graham at YC, but I think what people end up doing is just like, um, I forgot the name of the good, but just like certain goods where they're more expensive uh, and it makes you think they're higher quality, people who ask for advice are looking for some sort of silver bullet where I, where I go on to a sort of monologue or soliloquy of like a like, a lot of really interesting insights that they'd never heard of. But instead, when you say, make something people want, they're like, well, that was anticlimactic. Um, and essentially what happens in those cases is you have to tell people about this bias. And I found that the, the most successful people I've worked with are the ones who don't have to crash into the wall before they realize it's there. So the other thing is, I don't think a lot of people question, ask this question, which is my favorite question, which is why? And that will get us to the topic of uh, today. But I know a lot of people who will come out and I, I was one of them. It's like, okay, why are you doing this? 
and they get like a bit deer in headlights, like they wouldn't expecting anyone to ask that question. It's like, yeah, yeah, why, why are you doing this? What's, what's your goal? What's your personal motivation? Um, and they're like, oh yeah, I wanna grow. There, there can be so many answers. Some people are just like, hmm. And to be honest, there were times where I had that same approach and some people don't know why they're doing things or haven't thought about it and are just going based on instinct. Some people are looking to sell, looking to be like, oh, I'm the next Mark Zuckerberg or I'm going to sell my company for 300 million or a couple of billion then have pina coladas on a beach somewhere and relax. And there are other people who like, oh, I just want to help people. And I think what, what's worth saying, and I'll get to in a sec, le, second later, which is that they're not mutually exclusive, but if you don't know why you're doing something, it can be really difficult to actually hit a goal because that goal isn't linked to anything. So I, I think the why is something that people don't consider often. And that leads to another issue, which is they basically want to follow the path of what they perceive entrepreneurship to be. So they're like, oh no, to be an entrepreneur, I need to have an amazing idea that I'll have one day while like having a cup of tea. I think there's like this Madeline moment uh, where there's uh, in literature, there's an author who basically had one biscuit and he said that the whole story of a book came to him in one that one bite. And they expect something like that to happen. And they immediately tell people and everyone's like, oh my God, that's the best idea in the world, money. And then they're going to go and raise like a couple of million or billions. And then they're going to build a team uh, and work. And then like in a few months, they'll be like, or a year, they'll be like, boom, uh, we're rich. And now we're changing the world doesn't happen like that. And I think sometimes the startup culture or the perception of it makes people start for, I don't wanna have a value judgment to say that the wrong reasons, but the reasons through which it's hard to actually establish a target. So, and people end up, the reason I like the question why is that it actually helps people. It actually <laughs> helps people consider what will, for example, make them happy. I know so many people who have sold their companies, made millions and or done relatively well, and they're constantly still chasing something. And I, I, I think that sort of leads to the Th that sort of gets to the why point. And I, I think it's sort of worth sharing, um, Astrid and Christian, if you don't mind, it's sort of worth sharing, not the origin story, because this isn't a comic book, but um, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to sort of get into what series of events led me to actually questioning to asking that question more. Is that fine? Would be a great idea. Absolutely, Brilliant. yes, please. So, as I mentioned, I was working at Explorio. It was going well. Uh, we were featured in tons and tons of like publications, everything from The Guardian, TechCrunch, Wired, Huffington Post, if I'm not mistaken. National Geographic, we got featured 200 App Store features, which is amazing. Uh, we were doing really cool stuff like working side by side with Apple and uh, we ended up raising more funds. And what ended up happening was that um, a couple of things happened along in parallel. One, I ended up moving from this entrepreneur visa, which is which was really tricky because it's like, oh, you can you can get this visa, which is hard to get. Um, and basically if your startup fails or something, and obviously startups are notorious for failing, uh, 
uh, you basically can't actually switch to a job and you can't even build another company. So it's like, yeah, you can stay in the UK for a few years, but you can't do anything. So my only choice was I need to find someone really rich to marry or strike oil. Um, my, my other half works at the NHS, uh, my fiance. So I didn't take that first box, but uh, basically ended up working on that. And I moved to this humbly um, named visa, which was called the exceptional talent in tech. But that gave me a level of security and freedom that I hadn't considered before. And what ended up happening is that after about five years in Astorio, uh, I was at a mall in uh, London. And I suddenly had start, like I was, I think I was taking my Austrian, uh, Australian fiance um, to buy Pakistani clothes from the specific shop and my shoulder and back started hurting. Uh, a few days later, I ended up going to my doctor saying, I am having really bad like chest and back and shoulder pain. And they were like, oh, okay, it's, let, let's see what happens. Uh, and then I go to the hospital because I'm in a lot of pain and they're like, oh, you have pneumonia. I was like, oh, okay. Sorry, no, sorry. They said you have a chest infection. I was like, oh, okay. That's, let, let me go home. Came back three days later being like, um, what's it called? Came back three days later and uh, they're like, oh, you have a very aggressive form of pneumonia, very aggressive. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, then I came back one week later and I was like coughing blood and feeling really ill. And they're like, oh yeah, we don't, we, we think just pneumonia, keep having medicine. Um, here's some broad spectrum antibiotics and you'll be fine. A week later, I remember specifically saying to Christina, I like woke up one day, I was like, Chris, I think I'm gonna die today. And she was like, what? And I don't blame her. I am I can be a bit dramatic at times and that complements my love of talking. So she was like, is Isa just, what's up? go to the hospital and turns out I had blood clots in both of my lungs. So it's called a pulmonary embolism. So they started treating me and uh, I got on morphine, which was not as fun as I expected. Uh, but basically I went away and I actually started getting better. And I was, I think unwell for three months in which some of my colleagues would actually sit behind me on that sofa uh, and uh, just be around me so I don't die. <laughs> but after speaking to a hematologist later, what ended up happening was that she said I was really lucky to have survived because if that broke, went into my brain, um, it gets in, it, it get it, you can basically pass. So what ended up happening is after that, and I think during those three months that I was ill, I, it sounds really cliche, like, oh, We've just uh, like someone in a movie has like a near death experience, although I wasn't like near death, but I was lucky to have survived. And it started making me questioning. And with this new security, especially with as an immigrant uh, of having this visa, which allows me to like not have to work to stay in the country. That plus this new perspective made me start considering okay, what, what are the things or what are the goals I have? What are the targets I want to hit and what will make me happy? And now that also my family was safe um, in another country, uh, I was relatively safe and I had the support of a lot of people, friends and a wonderful partner. I realized that relative to my past and everything, um, the things I liked the most didn't actually cost money or a lot. I liked actually hanging out with friends, chatting, playing the guitar, uh, things that I'd put aside for so long because I was so busy like working to get out of a certain situation. And like, we have two cats who are currently locked in the other room. Otherwise they just keep jumping on me asking for food. Um, uh, the most fun is when I'm on work calls, one of the cats sits on that sofa edge because that's where the sun hits. And then she falls asleep. And while I'm talking to people, all we see is a cat go, Poof! 
So that's an amazing thing to see. But um, I realized that sitting on that sofa with a nice cup of tea and reading a book or browsing Reddit or Imgur um, with my fiance, those are the kind of things I like to do when reading. And that sort of set me down this path of how much money do I need? And I started questioning things like money, time, and what are the things that are important to me? And they weren't what I had sort of blindly followed in the past. So what ended up happening was I spoke to, I spoke to my team and I actually stepped down from what I was doing and took some time off. <laughs> I was planning to take time off for a while, but ended up uh, designing a fun project on a weekend, which turned my CV which I was annoyed at because it's not mobile responsive. I converted into a mobile um, app and shared that and ended up getting a lot of responses and a lot of interview requests. I ended up becoming head of marketing then head of product at a, a FinTech in London, which was really interesting going from a startup where you're like taking as little money as possible to go into a competitive startup. And that was interesting. And um, after about a year there, that fast-paced culture for an early, early, early startup wasn't right for me. And the pandemic had already begun. So actually I spoke to, I was catching up with a friend and talking about cultures, culture. And uh, that friend said, oh, uh, there's this really com interesting company called Symptoma, which you should speak to. And there's a, the friend is on, the person I know is on this call. Uh, and they actually introduced me to Symptoma because they're like, oh, I spoke to someone in a podcast and they have a cool company with a cool culture. So I worked on that, but then I started realizing that basically, first of all, what's interesting about Symptoma as well is that um, it's one of the goals and the CEO talked to me was that it was trying to help counter misdiagnosis. Uh, which was great because I've been a victim of that. And speaking of symptoma, and depending on when you're hearing this podcast, we're on the lookout for <laughs> product designers or UI and UX designers. So that's the shameless plug here. So if anyone needs, reach out to me on LinkedIn. But yeah, the more I started thinking about this, the more I looked into certain topics like hedonistic adaptation, which is like, uh, which is really interesting um about how the more money you earn usually what ends up happening is that you normalize to a certain happiness level uh, there's diminishing returns and the it's been and i'm still on this journey of questioning what i actually need and as i spoke to people i have a tendency to really i i tell a lot of people to I've historically told a lot of people, yeah, just build a startup. And they say a lot of things like, oh, no, but I'm doing this, I'm doing a job, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And yes, some in some uh, specific cases, um, that's a problem. But actually, you don't need to. It, it all depends on what you're... Um, perception of being an entrepreneur is. So for example, like I mentioned early on, there's this idea that you need to be like the Jack Dorsey's or the Mark Zuckerberg's, but it all depends on why you're doing something. So I would say that a person who's an entrepreneur is someone who creates some form of value. To be honest, that value could be for yourselves. It could be monetary, it could be a charitable venture, but exactly what it is or what you think, what your perception of an entrepreneur depends very heavily on why do you want to be one? And I think that is a surprisingly difficult question. Again, there's bits of feedback, there's bits or statements that are very hard to understand and absorb, but there are also questions that are super difficult for a lot of people. And essentially there's, 
it evolves over time and like one of the goals uh, my personal goals with regards to this podcast um is helping people think about their own journey in a similar way without <laughs> the need for a life threatening illness to help push them along that way so yeah th- that's what sort of led me and attracted me to this idea this topic and and don't get me wrong if you want to build a billion dollars company if you want to change the world help contribute towards curing cancer that's all fine if that's what you want to do and if you have some reasons to do that and in those cases entrepreneurship can be very very difficult it can be an uphill struggle where you need to like burn your ships and decide i'm going on this path regardless of what it has but similarly i know people who are um like making 5000 euros a month based on a small venture that um gives people like analytics advice that's an entrepreneur uh but what ends up happening is people's perception is a bit strange because they think if i'm not one of those million dollar entrepreneurs if i'm not changing the world if i'm not on the cover of tech crunch i'm a failure no there's there's this interesting thing which is that if you're taking other people's interpretation of an entrepreneur if you're going to sort of live your life based on that person's implementation or that person's stresses concerns or goals you don't need to do that and um for example <laughs> again like i know people who are building a, a startup not because they want to become super rich and have a yacht they're building a startup because they want to work two days a week and spend the rest of the week uh with their newborn baby and that's perfectly valid as well so i think and the irony of <laughs> uh this to- this thing i'm saying is that i'm saying don't let other people define or tell you what it means to be an entrepreneur use your own goals to decide that but i am aware of the irony that i am telling you something about being an entrepreneur but it's sort of a more meta approach in which it's like no figure out what your path is why it's important to you and depending on like what you're doing you don't have to i use the term burn your ships because in older times um being on a ship was horrible so people didn't like just say oh we're going to pay you for being on the ship we would uh they would basically get them excited about all the innovate like amazing things they'll see the places they'll be and there was this one term i think there was a uh, i don't want to use deep too deep into a war metaphor But there was someone who landed on some beach and wanted to conquer the island but uh what ended up happening was when they got off they burnt their ships because they said either we're going to conquer or we're going to die uh, <laughs> there's no going back and i think a lot of people see that with entrepreneurship like i need to quit my job <gasps> so much risk there's i need to full work on that i need to do all of this stuff no to be honest i advise a lot of people not to quit their job till they have validation but i'll get to that in a second let's stay a little bit um at this point what uh, the life of an entrepreneur really is i think this is a uh, um, key to success probably for many people and maybe we we shine a little bit more light on that um i i very often hear the perception when i start a business i must work 100 to 120 hours per week minimum to get things off the ground it would be difficult i won't have any life and i will have no friends i will leave everything behind and probably after 10 or 15 years i'm a billionaire so this is a picture i get very often and um in the preparation of this podcast episode i did a little bit of research um around the forbes 100 real time billionaire list uh which was led by elon musk briefly Uh, and I think now it's back uh, to 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 the old uh, 
old normal uh, Jeff Bezos is still the, uh, the, the most uh, successful and richest man on the planet. And I was looking at the 10 uh, richest people on this list and was thinking, do they really work uh, 24 seven to, to create this enormous wealth? And I tried to find some, uh, let's say some key figures uh, that I can relate to and made the number one key figure, how successful are they in their private life? Do they have kids and family? And all of them, all of them have kids, not only one, they have several kids, partners, family, and they have a private life. Um, what is your experience with uh, the entrepreneurs that you were coaching and mentoring that you saw? Uh, what was uh, the key factors that made them successful? How did they balance their professional and their private life? Um, good question. So basically, I think there's a lot of like legends of startups, right? where someone spent one weekend designed something that changed the world and stories where a person works like day, night, day, night, day, night. And the first thing I want to say is you working, it, it, let's say, sorry, this gets to the concept of something a lot of people call hustle porn, which is basically having almost being in a competition of how much you can hustle, uh, which is, oh, I slept three, day, three hours last night. And someone's like, no, I slept two hours, I win. And it almost seems like, oh, how badly could you treat your body, the competition? And, and the thing I find myself telling some people is I'm, there may be some, there may be some correlation but the amount of hours in a day you put into something does not equate to productivity or creating value. You could be working like 20 hours a day, but doing the wrong things, and which is fine, which is part of the journey. But basically you may not be being efficient with your time as well. And I know a lot of people who say, oh yeah, I worked like crazy on this and then I, I asked them what they did and they basically built a product for two years, spent 110,000 of uh, both their friends and family money and ended up putting out a product that no one wanted. And they're like, oh, I tried so hard, but I failed. It's, it's more about trying the right things or trying to get, learn how to do things in a certain way rather than just blunt force attack. So with the companies that I speak to, I often sort of try and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I often try to counter that, that ideology because burnout isn't fun. And especially if you're early stage, you can get quite demotivated because that's what you think you need to do. And there's a lot of these like quotes about, um, I, I forgot who said it, whether it was Reid Hoffman or Elon Musk, but entrepreneurship is like gazing into an, a bottomless abyss while eating shards of glass. And I'm like, it's, it's like, yes, if you're trying to create SpaceX, if you're trying to do something absolutely crazy where your goal is to make a, crazy, crazy startup that grows ridiculously fast, has a lot on the line, it, it is hard. Even if you create a small startup, it is hard. But it all depends on what you want. So essentially in those cases, I tell people to really balance out what they want because like one of the, uh, one example to give you and uh, Southeast Asia is notorious for this, which is, and this is something I never got, which maybe uh, potentiated me wanting to leave, <laughs> is a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I'm going to work really hard, work my way up, have three, four kids, pay for their university. And then when I'm 60 and retired, that's when I start living life. And I'm just thinking, dude, you're much older now. Your mind, body and everything aren't what it used to be. And you have a lot of restrictions. And at 60, you want to live. 
what if you didn't overwork yourself so much and instead started enjoying life at an early age as well rather than waiting that i'll hit 60 then i'll enjoy life so like i tell people to sort of balance out what they want and also like how much time is needed to achieve certain goals so for example i worked with some these amazing founders at a company called magdrive and when i they're basically creating a, a i'm not as smart as, as close to as smart as them but they're creating a form of electric plasma propulsion for spacecraft that's rechargeable and i got introduced them to a friend and they were talking about oh yeah we need to raise funds and do this and that to actually get our idea off the ground and work on it full time and actually it was like no 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 you can probably do something to at least get the ball rolling you don't have to uh, you can get the ball rolling without too much investment without too much time and then sort of develop your product into something that has a higher chance of success but in terms of hours it all depends on what you want uh if you want like literally if your goal is uh if your goal is to work less and i know so many people especially after the whole 4 hour work week uh publication was out people wanted to work less and i know someone who recently did actually sell their company to a very big games company um a close friend of mine and essentially even though he did that i think he spent some a lot the whole time he was working on his company i think he was working 3 days a week and two days he was uh being an art teacher because he loves painting so <laughs> for him his goal was the art gives me happiness as well as the work so i don't want to overwork myself because then am i work am i living to work versus working to live so it it may not be the most exciting answer but if someone wants to do something that's exceptionally hard in a very uh fast uh at a very fast speed based on either real or imagined urgency cool do whatever you can exhaust whatever efforts you can to get to your goal but if your goal isn't that you don't need to quit your job to artificially create a scenario where you have to work crazy hours to get money you could just spend some time on weekends or after hours to first validate that establish it and when it's sustainable quit your job so yeah as i mentioned the exciting the answer isn't the most exciting because it's practically it depends <laughs> it it makes absolutely sense in my in my opinion um to follow your approach when i think um about um let's say inventions of the last 20 years that impressed me uh one thing i really like is uh, the apple ipod so this is something that redefined the entire music industry and uh steve jobs was known to uh, come up with solutions that people need and uh he spent i think a lot of time observing what people are doing and how he can make a difference and amazingly still in our society um uh, observation is not a skill that is uh, very much honored it's just sitting sitting there and uh, doing basically nothing uh, it's like meditation uh amazingly still in our time we have this just industrial thinking that uh which comes from factories that you need to put in 12 hours or 16 hours per day to be productive yep. but these days are over so we are now in 2021 and um every company that i saw when they developed the product uh you you can't measure creativity in hours so what you say makes uh, absolute sense uh, to to balance your life better and uh, go more in that direction um but the thing is when when you talk in that way and uh, what i would be curious to understand uh, especially in the oxford ecosystem uh 
how do people take it when you talk this way? They say, yeah, you don't need to quit your job. You don't need to make it extra hard for you. Uh, what reactions do you get when you, when you give that advice? I think it's very mixed. I think the initial shock is because they don't expect me to say that. They expect me like, yeah, no, man, just buy like six months worth of ramen noodles, work day, night, quit your job, forget about that. Um, you can, do your neighbors have a shed? You can sneak into that at night and sleep there. And especially because like, I've been in the, in a situation where, because I had to move to Oxford and stuff, I had to literally give up everything and go there. Uh, and I, like, I think I can retrospectively rationalize and say, oh, there were lessons learned along the way, but to be honest, I would rather not have gone through certain hardships and not have taken certain risks if I didn't need to. So it, it's very interesting because again, I think that meta, meta issue comes up, which is will people actually take the advice or how do they have to fall into their hole themselves? And one of the, uh, there's this brilliant, um, entrepreneur that I um, had the pleasure of mentoring who was based in uh, Australia. His name was Jason. And I had a very interesting, I had very interesting mentorship sessions with him weekly. And I think what he started with was, oh, I want to, I'm from a Lebanese background and Lebanese um, is a mainly a spoken language. It doesn't have much of a written form. He's like, I want to make a language learning app for something that's not in a written form, which is an interesting challenge. Doesn't have its own script particularly. And I remember when he started out, he was like, yes, how do I do about, go about this? But he was a very, he had his, his head was on tight in the sense that it was good. He was a very smart person. Uh, sorry, he is, he's still around, uh, but basically, over the process of me talking to him because he was going to medical school or he planned to go to medical school. And the question was, okay, this is a time where I can pursue this before I have to start medical school. And basically what I told him was, yeah, don't jump off that horse yet. First figure out if this is actually something that when you if you decide to jump that horse jump off that horse you have a soft landing like there's a mattress there you created and he actually took that advice really well and in a lot of our sessions we ended up validating whether there was enough of a market to support him independently uh, and over time we realized that the answer was no at least not in how he envisioned it initially so sometimes it's funny because I can basically talk to people and say, I'm sorry, but I don't think you should pursue this. And sorry, not, not tell them, but give them the tools for them to be able to decide that. There are other people who are, and, and he, he saw the wood for the trees. Uh, and he was able to decide that actually no, my time might be better spelt on other things because he thinks figured out the opportunity cost. So that was a really positive experience. But there are a lot of people who basically come across as, um, how should I put this? No, but I want to be this. And I want to be this person immediately. And I'm, I basically suggest that yes, they can be, but even if they quit their job tomorrow, if they were actually going to start their startup work the next day, they would still need to validate whether that startup would work and be a good opportunity to consider. So what if before jumping ship, they actually did that work to consider if that if they could validate and understand the market for that startup before taking the leap. 
when I put it that way, people are like, that makes sense. A lot of people, it's funny because some people are also adrenaline driven. They chase the risks. So sometimes I actually speak to people who are more excited about the prospect of quitting their job and taking this leap of faith than actually starting the startup. And then there's also people who want to quit their job because they just hate their current job. So they were going to do it anyway. I like the idea really a lot, but um, I think that, I mean, at what stage are we really speaking of? Because I think if we take certain technology sectors, um, then the competition will just eat you at some point. So is this something where you say like, this is really like an idea stage or is it a type of where you really need to think through also financing strategy? Because inevitably, once you have, you know, started building something in one way or the other and then reach out for financing, um, then it also depends on sort of uh, where you go to. But the VCs will often ask, the, OK, so who are your competitors? You know, because in the end, every idea statistically comes up at least three times a day somewhere in the world. Very much agree. And uh, like, I won't pretend that this applies to everyone. If you're, if you're let's say, a postgrad student working on deep tech for um, image recognition, and the only way you'll take a leap is if you get like $500 million investment, okay. But in that case, you're possibly in an environment where you already have validation that that's needed. But let's say I come up with an idea today. And let's say I didn't pursue it, but or and it's been in my mind for a few months. Do not think that you need to quit your job to take the first steps. That's for sure. If you have the luxury of doing so, you have runway, you have savings, do whatever you want. But in a situation where you're not this minority and you're working a job, I would say that at the early stage, at least try and validate or work on your idea to a certain point that you can dis decide whether it's worth pursuing. Uh, so similar to, as I mentioned with the MagDrive team, they were able to actually start working on a prototype and then get a grant that ended up getting them some money where they could work part-time uh, towards that. And then what I had mentioned is that if you are able to build something, let's say they went out on their first day or early on in the idea where they had a simulation of their project. Investment, gaining investment is always an uphill battle, but this would have been a steeper incline because they didn't have a physical thing. Uh, and they had early validation of their technology, but not necessarily the market want or need. Speaking to VCs would have been much harder in the sense that you would have to talk to them at such an early stage that it would be so much risk to them that they'd have to invest, it, it, that they, it's quite a risky investment for them. And at that point, you know less about the market. So if you can spend, let's say the next few months even, working part-time, to be able to actually turn that into something different, more tangible, uh, or something where you can, it's really odd, but I find that sometimes, even if you just take like a little 3D printed model of something and you show people something, it's very different than talking about it. So if they could get to that point, I felt that they would get a better deal. And fortunately they recently closed, I think it was, upwards of 1.4 million from, um, I think it's Founders Fund, Peter Thiel's fund, uh, that's also an investor in SpaceX. So the deal that they would have gotten in terms of equity and potentially the type of investor would have been very different if they were starting at an early stage. And to be honest, at that time, a lot of founders haven't even thought about how much they actually need. In the UK, you have an SEIS goal. So people think I need 150 or I need 500,000 for EIS or something. 
And, or they say, oh yeah, this other company raised 1.5 million, we need 1.5 million. And then when you speak to a VC and the VC is like, okay, what do you need money for? They're like, they think of the number first and then work their way backwards. I'm not saying these guys did it, but a lot of people do that. They think of a number that sounds nice uh, and it usually has to do with social uh, approval. Uh, but basically then they work backwards and decide how they're going to spend that. And this also means that people overestimate what levels of equity to give. Uh, and essentially they overestimate the amount they need and end up giving up more equity for the money, even though they don't need that extra bit and at a worse rate. So like I said, I think what you wanna do, or at least my perspective on this, and there's an amazing world out there, uh, like there's a really amazing podcast called Indie Hackers. Uh, and what they do is uh, they have stories of people who've built their businesses without fund funding from VCs. And don't get me wrong, again, VC funding is very useful, uh, but for a certain type of company and a certain stage, and certain founders who have certain goals. Indie Hackers has stories of people who built products with like no funding. And it shows that you could actually go quite far once you've actually validated and understood your market. So if you're, you have an idea, you don't have any validation and it's really hard. And this is what the mom test addresses as well. You could go, some people will go and ask their mom, hey, look, I built this. They'd be like, oh, no, that's nice, dear. They'll ask some friends and family. And if it's in the UK, they'll all be very like polite and say, it's lovely, it's great. But none of that is actually valuable. That's not validation. If you have validation in terms of someone willing to pay for it, like literally one of the things I enjoy doing the most is doing a usability test, showing someone a product. They're like, oh, that's lovely. Uh, and that's really interesting. I would love something like that. Let me know when it comes out. And I'll be like, actually, if you pay $200 to me today, I can give you a 12 month subscription because it's already out. And then they're like, shit. So if, however, if I say that, and this is a test because it's bullshit, I don't have anything. If I say that and someone's like, sure, man, do you have a PayPal link? That is validation. And if you can get some of things, some things like that going to actually understand whether this is something that you, a risk that is worth taking, jump. Uh, but basically don't jump if you can't see the ground <laughs> or water. If it's complete darkness and you can't see, don't. At least try to build a fire is what the metaphor would be, then see where you're jumping, if that makes sense. I like the picture that you painted with uh, the ship, burning the ship. And I think we should spend more time in talking about what entrepreneurship really is. Um, so you said that uh, when the ship arrived at the foreign land uh, and the people on the ship wanted, wanted to conquer the land, uh, to make sure that they are motivated to do so, they burn the ship. When I talk with... Um, people who want to become entrepreneurs, um, I sometimes get the feeling they want to burn the ship before they even boarded the ship and sometimes even worse before they, <laughs> before they start building the ship. So they want to go to the end result immediately without understanding the process that uh, is needed to come to this end result. And uh, this process is a very long one. And when I look at the, the most successful companies, even uh, Tesla, for example, I didn't really get the feeling that uh, Elon Musk started out burning everything behind him, leaving uh, all friends and jumping directly 30 years into the future um, at the end result where he's now today. Um, what is your experience with people? Um, is it really possible to teach that thinking uh, that entrepreneurship is more a process than a result? Or uh, is it a, a born ability that some people are just born entrepreneurs? I, I think it's a mix of nature and nurture in the sense that there'll be some people who <laughs> biologically will have certain attributes that 
make them more likely to be entrepreneurs. I'm not saying that they'll be better as entrepreneurs. Um, I do think a lot of the thinking and things can be taught. Pardon me. And let me put it this way. Um, I have a few friends with ADHD, right? And what's funny is uh, I don't think of it as a disorder or a deficiency. I, I just think of it as neurodivergent, which is you're different in where you think. I think there's a 300, 400% higher chance that a person with ADHD will become an entrepreneur. I think that that is attributed towards one thing, which is hyper-focus, uh, which people can do because ADHD is more, not just about that you get distracted by everything, but it's that you have trouble regulating focus. So either you can get very distracted by things when you're doing something you don't like. And when you're doing something you like, you can spend three days on it with forgetting to eat food. So I think, um, I, I think in, for example, people like that, they might take crazy risks more, they may, may be more likely to take crazy risks than others, right? Uh, they might do something that everything thinks is absolutely crazy. Like, um, and the funny thing is a lot of great startups sound like stupid ideas at start. Oh, I'm going to start renting air, air mattresses in my downstairs lounge to people. What is that now? Airbnb. Sorry, I don't imply that they have ADHD or anything, but I mean, the fact is that that almost naive persistence or brute force sometimes does work. Uh, the problem, however, is we have, conf I think it's called selection or confirmation bias, which is the, the people who succeed, when they tell you the story, they're like, oh yeah, we did work really hard, this happened. A lot of it is luck as well. And the problem is you only see the people who succeed, not the 99.9% .9 who don't, because there's like an, a huge graveyard of startups that never saw the light of day. And like I, it depends on what it depends on what you're doing it for. I know people who've taken that leap, right? They've basically said that, okay, I'm really scared of this thing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to literally burn my ships. That is, I'm going to put everything in my life linked to this one outcome. And don't get me like wrong. I did this myself. I came to the UK with no money. And in that case, I don't think it was, in my opinion, it wasn't even a choice. It was the only thing I had left to do to escape that sort of gravity of uh, what my life was in the past. And, but for others, just realize that there is a chance, a pretty big chance, more than there is a few succeeding of you failing. And if you haven't got either savings, if you don't have a job to pay the bills, um, it can be very hard taking that risk. And I think there was someone, there was an article in the New York Times or something that talked about how a lot of entrepreneurs are people who are rich or have support networks. Um, so I, I forgot, was it a founder of Snapchat or Instagram? Basically, people argued that a lot of the people who are entrepreneurs, especially ones that are doing well, are people for whom taking a risk to go and spend two years working on a startup doesn't matter because their parents will either bail them out, they have savings, or their parent will get them a job as an investment banker or something or the other. So for people like that, there's a lot less risk to consider. So if you're in that position, go ahead. But if you're not in that position, I would say, try like literally try, I think that metaphor, it's like, don't jump off a bridge uh, till you know how high up you are. <laughs> And instead, light a fire. And what I'm saying is, 
try to get some sticks together, light a fire, and at least know whether it's worth jumping the off or not. I think what we are talking about is uh, to understand how to calculate risk and how to take calculated risks. Uh, and I think this is one skill that every entrepreneur needs to learn uh, with his business or her business. Um, so the, the starting point of uh, building companies most often is a thought process and it's not necessarily uh, something you need to invest right away. So it's just sitting down, going through this, this uh, business plan templates, finding out what is my vision? What is my vision? Where do I want to be? Is it really something that other people need? And I completely agree to what you said. This can be done in parallel to other jobs. Um, understanding this uh, time management, the value of time management, the value of uh, when do I need to invest more time or more capital and when is less capital needed, I think this is key to success. And um, Elon Musk, for example, uh, he's using this method, which I think he calls it time boxing, where mm. it just... Uh, separates the day in different time slots and uh, focuses on one task at a time. And the amazing thing is with this method that a lot of things can be done in parallel, which must not necessarily be sequential. So this, I think, is uh, one valuable lesson out of uh, this podcast to understand that uh, building a company doesn't mean you need to jump right away and take the utmost risk to get started uh, you can do it in a much smoother way which i believe every successful entrepreneur actually does so did you did you study um, people like uh, warren buffett Elon musk mark zuckerberg did you see in those or, or friends amongst you that you supported to build their companies uh, when, yeah. you look at the, when you look at the success cases, <laughs> you really see a lot of these people that uh, <coughs> burned the bridges before they even came to the bridges. What's, in what's interesting is like, if you read, there's this amazing book called Founders at Work, if I remember correctly, which is from Jessica Livingston, who's one of the co-founders of Y Combinator. It talks about the stories of entrepreneurs who made it big. And yeah, there's such a ver huge range of cases. And like sometimes, for example, people choose that burning of their uh, ships because they need to be motivated. They may feel, they think that that is going to fix other problems or like if they're stressed or unhappy or depressed, they're like, oh, let me just do this and then that's going to fix everything. No, I think I told someone uh, who was feeling relatively depressed at a time that don't think entrepreneurship will solve your depression. Instead, treat your depression first and then consider it because you, a lot of people have what I call false attribution. Uh, humans think in a very linear way. And when we see things, we try to make a pattern out of it, which is why like, if you see some random abstract thing, you'll see a face in it. The problem is we can rationalize that way as well. So we start thinking, oh, there's a pattern in this which is why people lose money on the stock market and in gambling and stuff, right? Uh, and essentially, sorry, back, back to your point. I remember a story that was incredibly inspiring to me, which is actually related to Elon Musk. Um, and just once he actually sold his first business and then did more in PayPal, to be honest, if you have a couple of million, if you have hundreds of millions or a couple of billion in the bank, the story changes. But I remember being really motivated by a story that when him and his brother were relatively poor, um, he taught himself, I think, I forgot, is it programming or something? And he found out that he could get work programming for other people. And what he did, <laughs> And I, to be honest, that sort of shaped my life in a way. What he did was he realized that he could, if everything went to shit, everything fell apart, he could at least help some people with their programming needs and make enough money. Uh, they had a little like an office space that was also the place they would sleep, right? He realized that as long as he could afford some of these hot dogs and bread 
and the place to sleep, he'd be fine. So he figured out the minimum amount of money he needed to live. Once that was established that he could make that, even if everything went to shit, he realized that actually that's de-risked my life. Now there's no risk. Worst thing, I work on this for a year. It fails horribly. I go back to eating hot dogs and sleeping on the sofa. Once you know what that worst case scenario is, it's amazing. And the thing is, I had a similar experience because for me, a big problem was the visa. But once I got that, my cost of living isn't very high, especially with a pandemic where I'm not paying 450 pounds a month to commute on a three hour train, which I don't enjoy either. But it's like, what are my costs? Rent and food. And I'm not living in a super expensive place or anything. And I don't actually need a lot of those fancier things. Okay, so I could live off this. If I could build a side business that makes, pardon me, X amount, uh, I could then, de or if I got a job that I did one or two days a week that paid me that amount, I could then completely de-risk the situation and then go pursue other things. Or if I had savings or something or the other. So it, in that case, like I saw that happening with Elon Musk and I remember him mentioning that, I think it is in the Ashley Vance book of his, if I correctly remember the author and thinking that makes so much sense. And not only after a year of working on something, if it fails, actually you'll probably have learned something in that one year, which means you can charge a bit more or do different kinds of jobs. Obviously, right now we're in a global pandemic where everyone's worried about jobs and things. And you also have to consider the demand. He was sort of at the early days of the program in, and the dot-com boom. So he knew someone would need a programmer. <laughs> These days, if you're in a situation where you have a job and you have so much demand that let's say you did quit your job, but you knew because you've thought about it, and planned around what you need and why you're doing something, you can decide that, oh, okay, worst case scenario, I have my friend's company who said that they'll hire me as a programmer, a marketer, whichever thing, at the drop of a hat. So at least I won't be homeless. Then that de-risks it for you. And Yes, I must admit there's a, like Paul Graham himself, like when he's asked if he'd start a startup again, he says no. And he says, and people ask him why he's like, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort. And he's like, I no longer have poverty as a motivator. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting hearing people's stories. Some of them have come from nothing, but that's, not all of it. And I don't think, and I think, yes, if you look at it retrospectively, like, wow, that person went through a lot of shit, kept walk, went, like, you know how they say, if you're going through hell, keep, go, keep walking, keep moving. You don't want to stay, get stopped there. Yes, it's, it's completely makes sense to admire the people who are in those circumstances. And more often than not, uh, people weren't poor or in a difficult situation because they chose to be. They were in a situation. They were thrown into the fire or they were in a difficult situation. Um, I don't think, while it's good praising their persistence, I don't think you need to jump into a fire to prove to yourself or other people that you're good enough. You, let's say you comfortably started a company and this also depends on like urgency. A lot of the times when people say things are urgent and this annoys the hell out of some people that I've worked with in the past, I'm like, why is this urgent? Is there an external pressure? Is there a deadline? And then some people just get confused and they're like, no, it's when I want it. And then I explain, but I have these other things to do, which you also said were urgent. Which one would you rather me do? And people get so confused because it's like, 
oh, so what are the consequences of that not happening? And to be honest, I only did this after I got all my good visas and stuff. Because previously, you don't want to like make waves. It's like, what's the consequence of this not happening? And they look at me like dumbfounded. One, I remember in a previous company, the CEO was like, looking at me like, do you want to lose your job? By not, and like, he was like, so, because I want it done by then. I was like, no, no, I understand that. But what are the consequences of not doing it? Similarly, a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the trap of doing if I don't do this now, I'll never succeed. If this is not launched by tomorrow or next week, it won't succeed. If that's a way for you to motivate yourself and push yourself, cool. But startups don't have to and often don't turn into a success overnight. Jeff Bezos started with a bookshop, an online bookshop. And I forgot reading somewhere, but there were people talking about how Oh yeah, uh, Jeff Bezos did a workshop in Harvard when he was early stage and uh, the class was there to sort of tear apart uh, the students would practice with a real business and try to understand if it works or not. And all the students got together and say, I think you should try something else because you won't be able to compete with Barnes and Nobles and other companies who have that scale. But yeah, it's a bit, it's also a bit con not contradictory, but there's a bit of a conflict. And if I don't have an answer on how to resolve that, and this is a problem I face myself as well, which is how do you know when to quit or when something isn't working? I know someone who started an alternate like test for cancers because his grandmother died of can that cancer. And for him, he didn't care about, oh, this, uh, in my early market validation test, there wasn't a response or this happened. He didn't care. He worked for God knows how many years and got it done. And in those cases, it can be really hard to say, is this working? Is this not working? In the examples I gave, there's a relatively easy sort of litmus test. Are people, for example, are people willing to pay for this? Even if 10 people are willing to pay for this, it's like, oh, there's some potential for money. Or the other litmus test is if it costs you 1500 euros a month to cover your groceries and rent, can you make 1500 month first? A month? And that can tell you whether you're, it's a success or not. So yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, I think it that's a very, really complex. important point actually here because it's also that uh, basically, it's it, it, creating a successful startup in itself does not only mean that you have the best technology, for example, but it's a really a matter of many different factors. Because as we have seen also in the past, sort of, uh, it's not always the best technology that wins. So you have to have to really a good strategy going back to forwards and how you will actually reach the customer. And that sort of ties in back to the questions of why are you actually doing all of this? Yes. And you see, we've come full circle because if tomorrow, if tomorrow someone says, hey, we found a way to, um, to detect pulmonary embolisms way before they're going to happen. And I'll just remember those three months of the worst pain in my life and everything I explained. And I'll be like, oh, I want to solve this problem. Because even if I can help save a few people from that, it's worth it to me. Versus if I'm like, oh no, but I just want to find a way to get X money to build a, to buy a house. Neither of those are bad, but it depends on how much shit you're willing to put up with. And if you want to, and, and sometimes it's really funny. I spoke to someone and they were like, um, Oh yeah, I want to build this app and I want to have I want to end up making this much money. And basically at the end of the day it turned out that they were also teaching maths. <laughs> this is a student in Oxford. They were teaching maths and charging $100 an hour. And I basically did some maths and said, "Look, it may work, it may not, but at the moment if you want to hit this goal of saving up this much money, you should drop this and instead work on teaching maths more. 
And uh, that can be entrepreneurship in its own way. And I said, actually, I'm instead going to help you try to build a web presence to amplify your reach. And you'll actually make money, more money that way. And he initially struggled because it's not the exciting thing. You want, people want to be like, oh, I built an app or a website and I became a millionaire like that versus I teach a lot of kids math. <laughs> and it, again, it depends on why you're doing this. If your goal is money and low risk, just teach me for more math. There's no, if, you've, if, you're, if you're a young person who's managed to buy a house, which is really difficult in these, this day and age, because you've taught more math taught people math, that's not a bad thing. That's a pretty bloody impressive thing. So yeah, it's just funny how it goes around full circle because every decision you make ends up factoring into the why. And I think like that's the one thing I'm trying to help more and more people question. And this route, this sort of, I really love this framework, uh, which I think originally comes from Japanese management, but Aaron Swartz, um, sadly he passed, but he was an amazing entrepreneur. Um, and he, his blog mentioned and was the first time I saw the five why, which is asking, trying to get to the root of a problem. And there was an example I think someone mentioned, which is, you can have a production line in which uh, you can get a production line in which something keeps getting messed up and you have different options. You can shout at the worker and say, oh, you're messing this up. Okay, will that work? Maybe, maybe not. So why is the worker messing up? He doesn't have enough time to do the job. It's like, oh, okay. Why doesn't he have enough time to do the job? And then you get to a thing, realize that, oh, the parts that he needs to assemble, the box of the parts is 10 feet that way. So if we just slow down the whole production line, that will affect uh, production. But yeah, the box is 10 feet away. So the, in the time it takes for him to go back and forth, he doesn't have time to do everything properly. What's the solution? Move the blocks closer to him. In all of these cases, like even with fundraising, it's like, why do you need that much? And, and then like, there's so many people who come to me saying that, oh, I need like 1.2 million. And I'm like, sure. And I think this Socratic approach is also quite good where you question things rather than telling people because it disarms them a bit and forces them to consider what they actually need. Which sometimes people just don't do. And then you say that, like I've literally had someone who's come to me and said, I want to make this for 1.2 million. And later we realized that he wanted to go for 1.2 million because that's what he thought was a good number. And Astrid, I wouldn't be surprised in your experience working in the VC industry and stuff. Maybe people haven't been honest about that, but people have probably come to you with that same mindset. And then oh, I, I could tell you stories about um, uh, very, you know, creative valuations and all that with no substance. So I could tell you stories and stories about that. Yeah. Yes. And the thing is, that's interesting is when I actually sat them down and I spent half an hour, the whole amazing vision they had and the three year plan. And I was laughing because I was like, oh, most startups don't know what's going to happen next month. And you have a three-year plan, which is also a byproduct of the industry because you have some old school VCs in the UK and stuff who are like, oh, where's your three-year business plan? And I'm just like, lol. Uh, but what ends up happening is that they realize, shit, if I had 12,000 pounds, I could build this and test it. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> now that's a very different scale number than 1.2 million. And the difficulty in raising 1.2 million versus 12,000 is huge. I think it always comes back, to uh, comes back to understand where you are in the process. So there is the right instrument for the uh, right point in time in the process. So mm. there is something to three years or five years plan when uh, somebody has already built a company with a few billion of revenue 
and a few thousand employees. So this is more an instrument for later stage companies. Uh, early stage companies, yeah. um, it, it's, it's a different kind of game. It's a different kind of game. What I found very interesting while you were talking was this uh, term that you brought up, side business or side hustle. It took me 43 years to figure that out, that uh, it's possible to work in a job and uh, do something on top of that. So this is, I think, still in the, when I look at, uh, at the school, for example, how children are taught, I think still today the narrative is uh, finish school, go to university, get a degree, get a job, and do everything sequentially. Industrial revolution-based yeah. motivation. And three years ago, I came across Gary Vaynerchuk, and he started talking about side hustling. And I thought, well, what's that? What, what, what's a side hustle? And How have you managed to listen to Gary Vaynerchuk without swearing multiple times in a minute? It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gary Vaynerchuk is amazing. Yeah. But uh, I think this is, this is um, the, a different kind of spirit that you're talking about. And so this is the, the early stage of the process. And when we look about the later stages, when a company is built, uh, then, of course, I mean, at some point in time, people have to jump ship and make a decision and say, okay, do I stay in my job or do I dedicate 100% of my attention on this one business? Also, Jeff Bezos uh, in his book, uh, Invest and Wonder, uh, Invent and Wonder, I think I have it here. So I'm not affiliated, so I don't get anything. Commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Commercial. But uh, I think also he went through this process. So he was working at the hedge fund uh, before he founded Amazon. When I remember it right, and he was looking at the internet, and he got amazing studies and saw these growth rates and uh, how many people went online back in 1994. But I think also he had some process where he was uh, considering: does it make sense? Is it really uh, a way to go? Mm. And of course, I mean, 27 years later, richest person on the planet. But it took him 27 years to go through this process, and. Uh, when I mentor or coach uh, entrepreneurs, it's still, I think, one of the, the biggest problems is that people want to jump. They want to jump 30 years in the future and have everything accomplished, but don't want to go through this process. Is it just me who makes this experience as a mentor or do you make similar experiences also in the United Kingdom? I think very, very much so. I think... <laughs> And it's funny because I can relate because <laughs> I can get distracted relatively easily. And I like working on multiple things, which I don't think is a bad thing in, again, it's just neurodivergent. It's what you are, how you think. A lot of people I find are excited about the prospect of starting a company, not the prospect of building a company or growing a company. Because they're very two different things. One is like, oh, I started a business. I did this. It's a new idea. I turned it into something. And then the three years, you're, you're work, the three, five, 10, 24 years, you're turning it into something slowly that has an overnight success. There's like three years to an overnight success, 10 years to an overnight success. And yeah, no, people, people a lot of people love instant gratification. And again, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Some people like the idea of instant gratification, then start a startup, then realize that it's more work than they expected and they leave. But to be honest, in some cases, I would applaud them because they tried. Then there's other people who start something and... Um, they want instant gratification or they want a quick win and they build something that is a quick win. Like I know, and, and the problem is when that market gets saturated because I think a lot of things like, how should I put this? There was a time that a lot of people were getting rich on a uh, start your own t-shirt line online, right? Or start your own marketing agency or start one thing or the other. And then what happens is some people get into it. They do have relatively quick success because they're starting or emerging in something new, but then they're not 
willing to sort of wait for the, or do the work that goes all the way. Now this again goes to why. I know someone whose goal was to sell their startup in six months, didn't work out. I know someone whose plan was uh, to, uh, like I, I know this guy who's absolutely bloody uh, impressive and interesting. He's called uh, Peter Levels. I think his website is levels.io, L-E-V-E-L-S.io. And what he did was, he's like, okay, I'm not happy with how things are. I'm going to build 12 startups in 12 months. He did it. And a lot of them didn't work, but I think two or three of them worked. And last time I checked, he was making something like 2.5 million a year. This is, this so is what, something... This is sorry to interrupt you. This is something I don't understand when I hear this. Um, when people tell me I want to build a startup to sell it in six months, they always think they go on the stock market. I mean, uh, buy buy a company, buy shares, and sell it. You can sell anything in six months without uh, ruining your life. Um, when and it I depends. Look, <laughs> when I look Sorry. at when I look at entrepreneurship. Uh, Entrepreneurship is still building businesses. And when I look at the big successes that mm. we have, I think this is, this is one of the paradigms we have to make people aware. Uh, Elon Musk didn't build Tesla overnight. Jeff Bezos mm. didn't build Amazon overnight. Mark Zuckerberg didn't build Facebook overnight to what it is today. Uh, and there's so and many- you said something that's really interesting. You said... And this is funny because this is how pervasive this myth is, which is like, oh, invest in the stock market versus ruining your life. Because it's like, you see startups as so much risk. But like, yes, if they quit their job, didn't have savings, didn't have a support network, worked six months on that, spent all of their savings on it, and it didn't work, it's a very high chance that they'll ruin their life. But if they did these certain things before jumping the ship, jumping off the ship, that's better. But like, again, in, the, in this case, if a person quits and has no support uh, net, it's, it's something that you'd be like, lol. If someone does have a support net or does this quietly in six months, there's little to no risk. And And to be honest, I understand and empathize with some people who want to build multiple things back to back. And Peter Levels actually had several people who wanted to buy certain companies. He didn't want to do that. And what he did, which I really respect and I want to do more of, uh, which is also a great way because through mentorship, I'm actually talking to people and almost being a, a temporary founder. But I think that like lifting weights and growing muscles, you can practice being an entrepreneur. And this guy, after 12 months of building 12 startups, cut through the bullshit, the doubt, the concerns, all of this stuff, and the worries about, oh, maybe this startup needs to be perfect and I need to spend one year on it. He's like, no, constraint. We're going to spend one month on it, put it out there, And of the 12 things, see what sticks and whatever sticks to the wall, I'll work on that more. And basically, yeah, like if you, if you want instant gratification, if you want to, like I am one of the people who I'm fortunately comfortable at the moment. And I sometimes like the idea of helping people. And more often than not, I just love building things. So if, If I can build 10 things in a, in a year, I would do that for fun. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't, doesn't. But some people are people who are, and this is why sometimes co-founders work out because I was speaking to one of my mentors uh, and an investor in my previous company. And he was saying that there are some people who are great at building, starting a startup and the ideas guys. But then there's the people who scale the startup. And some really successful startups happen when those two people meet. But again, it's like, if you're doing this for fun, let's say if you don't have enough money to invest in the stock market or know exactly when GME is going to go up, and it is a risk still, 
but you don't have the capital, but you have the hustle. You can spend a couple of weekends working on something. If you have that safety blanket or if you have that job, take as many risks as you want. Because at the end, you'll be able to sleep on that metaphorical sofa eating hot dogs and bread. You so, mentioned that, you know, one can actually practice being an entrepreneur. So what kind of skills would you say, you know, a successful entrepreneur would bring to the table? I think one you already mentioned at the beginning, sort of that some people are actually resistant to uh, help or don't want to listen. And I think that is actually already a very valuable skill. So this coachability, as I often say. Mm. So I think the inverse of that is also true. Some people, sometimes it helps being a stubborn ass. In the sense that, uh, but the thing is, again, that's a very different type of, there's not just one path to entrepreneurship, which I think is related to the theme here. You can do this, but you can also be someone who said, well, everyone else can go to hell. I'm going to make this work. And maybe it takes 10 years, <laughs> maybe it takes 20 years. They might get there, but it depends. If that's something they care about, fine. I think with the other things, there's, this is quite, and this is where it gets tricky. It depends on whether if you're building things alone or with other people. So, and it depends on your uh, environment or your sector, right? So I'm going to talk about what I know, which is the technology sector, which is related to websites and apps. Now, it also depends on your resources. If you have some savings and can find someone to build things for you, great. But ideally in your team, depending on the product you're building, you should either know or be willing to learn what you need to learn to get things rolling. So I think apart from coachability, willingness to learn and do things that aren't perhaps what you enjoy. Some programmers I know hate sales. They just hate the idea of talking to someone. Uh, and basically, uh, there's others I know who are like, well, if I want to hit my goal, I have to do this. Or they find people who can do it. So there's different types of entrepreneurs. Just like if you play like a online RPG, you can be like a, a paladin, a wizard, a, a rogue, an archer. I know people who are amazing because you can throw them in a room and they'll find, ins they'll inspire people and connect people. And they don't have to know how to do, they are really valuable people because they don't need to be good at anything themselves. If they can inspire, find and connect people from different backgrounds to create something, it's fine. That's what they need. And instead of learning how to, like, I like talking to people. I like networking. I like helping and connect people. I like mentoring. Uh, one of the pieces of advice that a friend gave me was, Isa, you don't need to learn how to program. Because you can probably find either hire or get someone excited enough about your idea for them to do it with you if you want to founder. Similarly, like, it depends on also how good you are at your field, where you can also prove to people that you're going to make a dent. But sorry, I digress. In terms of the, in terms of the skills, I think coachability, yes. I think willingness to learn, I think overcoming doubt, self-doubt is a very important thing sometimes. And that's something where founders help a lot because you keep reinforcing um, each other. I think a persistence and determination are like the uh, usual ones. I think knowing when to quit. <laughs> and I think one thing that's important is having a bullshit filter. And most importantly with that filter is applying it on yourself. 
when are you selling yourself an idea regardless of evidence on the contrary to the contrary when are you telling yourself to keep going on something that doesn't have a future and i've seen so many people fall into that trap and maybe they'll succeed 20 years down the line but you need to be able to understand whether in an instinctual way which i don't fully understand or through being able to separate the truth from what you wish the truth was um that's incredibly important yeah i think that it's probably also important to also know your limits sort of say because what i experience of with speaking to founders is that they have the feeling they have to know everything and need to be able to do everything but as you write to say i think it's also important that you recognize what you are not able to do and what others are much better at doing and finding those unique combinations and being able to actually let go of that part and say like no someone else is actually much better in doing that so go on and do the stuff and i'll do the things that i'm really really good at yeah and i think one thing that also just came to mind in terms of the practicing and this i remember from peter levels is that um let me just have a sip but the thing that i remember him mentioning was reining yourself in some day times because like one of the things i struggle with is perfectionism especially when i'm building something of my own completely my own you're giving all your love your attention your care your focus into this thing which is as close to a representation of you as possible sometimes and sometimes you can feel that a person criticizing that is the same as a person criticizing you and that leads to this defensiveness and what you almost want to be able to do is shed that defensiveness because otherwise like there's a lot of people i've seen who seen multiple multiple examples of usability tests in which people don't understand their product and these are the kind of people say oh users are the idiots they're just idiots not that oh shit my product my baby is at fault or i am at fault but you be able to disconnect your ego in some way is good and i think the other thing is resisting the urge to perfect before you launch or resisting the urge to i think it's in in programming it's called the anti pattern is called polishing the cannon ball it's going to be fired out of a cannon you don't need to polish it right so i i've seen lots of cases and i do this quite often um in the sense that you're so worried about all of the potential things in the world that you don't put something out and if you don't put something out you don't get feedback about whether it's working or not and like one of the things i want to learn how to do better is iterating in the field put something out super early because i think someone said uh, give give good advice saying that if you're not embarrassed by it you're sharing it too late versus quietly building something like i i know someone i think his company was I, i mentioned this earlier i think he spent 2 years on a product that everyone in his in the architecture field was like oh this is great this is interesting 2 years later he launched a product that no one else had ever seen spent 110000 pounds and he was referred to me as because he wanted marketing advice and i said the reason people aren't signing up is because you don't you've assumed so many things you've built something based on a problem that you had but you didn't check if other people had it and you've made so many assumptions because of how long you've spent in isolation that you've built something no one wants or needs so i would say having the ability to overcome either that ego a detach the ego and overcome the natural inclination to perfect something before it goes out 
and I, I, I'm saying a lot of these things, but I can know what the problem is, but not have solved it myself. I think the best example I found of this is from this channel on YouTube called Smarter Every Day, uh, which has this amazing guy. And he gives a perfect example, which is, I can tell you that on a, on a bicycle, you have, to, you have to pedal and you have to keep the handle straight and move it slowly in the direction. Oh, sorry, no, actually, uh, the, the example was this, you know how to ride a cycle, right? Let's say you've ridden a bicycle. Now I can tell you that if I invert the tire or the mechanism so that when I turn left, it goes right. When I turn right, it goes left. I can tell you that you can know what the problem is or you could know what the change is. But I guarantee that when you sit on the cycle, you will fall and mess up constantly because knowing is not the same as understanding to the point that you're able to apply it. So I just want to say that, yes, I'm aware of these problems, uh, but I don't mean to share them in a dismissive way, which is like, oh, these are such easy things that I shed long ago. Nope, these are things I still struggle with quite frequently. Um, so, but it's a journey. And I think the why for me is becoming more and more the act of slowly getting more answers and learning more. So it's funny for me, and, and this, uh, one of our pre investors in a past startup, Misha Gopal, amazing guy, runs an incredible startup called FatMap. Uh, he is a very avid mountaineer. I think he lives in Chamonix in France. Uh, and um, he, uh, one thing I love about him is that he talks a lot in terms of like mountaineering metaphors. And one of the things he said was that you almost need to change your meta goal. He said that you're from point A and you want to climb to the peak of a mountain and that's point B. And if your, if your goal is I want to get to B, on the first day, if you don't climb up to B, you think, oh, I failed. But he said something really interesting that I'm still thinking about, which is you don't want your goal to be point B. That's the wrong way to think about it because you can beat yourself up when you fail. He said, instead, your goal is learning how to eventually get there <laughs> or basically moving in that direction, which it's much harder to fail at and is more realistically conveying the effort, the time and the mindset that is needed for that long-term growth. So, in this sort of journey, like for me, the why I've uncovered parts of it, which is like build things because I enjoy building, the act of building. Like I'm so excited because this weekend I'm going to create, a, use some old wooden pallets to create a, 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 a shelf for my amp, guitar amp. Just the idea of taking something from an idea to a end result is just, it's just, makes me feel ecstatic and happy. That's one part of my why. The other is helping people. I've been in a situation where I've had help and knowing how hard certain parts of entrepreneurship can be or in general life. I don't wanna judge people. I want to do things that help people, preferably at scale, which links to building. And I think the last part of the why that I'm slowly poking a hole at, poke, uh, poking is, thinking, how can I put this well, but not, and, and sorry, this sounds so cliche because every, every other movie about adventure talks about it, but literally not making the goal B because the problem is every time I climb one mountain, I see another one higher up and I decide, okay, no, when I climb that, I'll be happy or I'll be a success. 
Instead, I want to see success as being the person who's always trying to grow. And I'm still figuring that out. And sorry, That's I talked great. a lot. So hopefully <laughs> I, I need to give you guys more opportunities to chat. <laughs> That's brilliant. I mean, what, what kind of advice would you give, you know, a young budding entrepreneur or someone who is aspiring to get into this space? Um, if, if I just think about it, I guess I, I've, I, I'll sound like a broken record because I've been saying this again and again and again. But just think about why you're doing things. A lot of us are on a path set by what I like to think of as like a multi-generational momentum. You have people who is like a blacksmith because their father was a blacksmith and their father father was a blacksmith. And, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Uh, maybe their environment and everything made them see the blacksmith as their true calling or that's something they enjoy or something they started out needing to do and now enjoy it. But I would basically say that just question your motivations, basically ask questions and why is one of them. Don't take things as face value. If someone says, <laughs> and I've done this in the past, if someone says, no, you have to come into the office to work, ask why. <laughs> right now, COVID has shown us most of us can do our jobs uh, with the exception of people who have to go in, see patients, or do physical work. We can do it from home. Why didn't we do this earlier? Because that's how, it's, that, that's how it was done for ages. And I think Paul Graham mentioned something really interesting about this is that a lot of the questions you ask that can make people feel uncomfortable, not like being rude or being obscene, uh, but They, uh, people avoid the questions that make them uncomfortable because that questions the nature of everything they do. If you ask someone who's 50, 60, has been working at a bank all of their life and hates, which is not a bad thing, but hates their, hated their job, and you ask them why they didn't leave, and maybe they joined because their father was a banker. But if you ask them now why they didn't leave, And they retrospectively realized, wow, there wasn't no, any reason for me to be doing this all the time. It can create a lot of friction. And even for yourself, you may be like, oh, why am I, let's say relative to Pakistan, why am I getting married at 21? Because that's what my parents expect of me. And this is probably not going to make me very loved in Pakistan because it's like, but sure, is that something you want? And, and sometimes I've actually heard the sad answer from people about it's not what I want. And I don't say sad in terms of that they're not fulfilling their potential, but I have to account for the fact that I'm relatively privileged and so are a lot of other people who can make these choices. Sometimes there's a choice, but you can't really make it without consequences. But if there are choices that based on where you are in life, or based on your privilege or lack thereof that don't have immediate negative consequences, ask why you're doing that or not doing it. For a long time, I put guitar off on hold because um, I realized guitars aren't going to get me a visa for moving to another country. It's more likely if I build up certain skills, they will. But then even after those crises and those fears and those concerns went away, I kept going and not picking it up. And actually in the pandemic, because of the nature of it, it leaves a lot of time to think. And I realized I bloody love playing the guitar. And I picked it up again. And I think about, okay, why wasn't I doing it? Okay, there was a time where there was a valid reason. But then there was a time where I decided, oh no, when I become rich, when I have no issues or anything, and I don't have like pressures and stuff, I will 
I will basically um, do the things I enjoy. But then question, why can't I do the things I enjoy now? And I'll sort of end on one thing, which is something a colleague of mine said, and she has a medical background. And she said that she was, she was doing well. She was growing as a consultant, earning a good amount of money. And what she saw around her were other doctors. And again, if you wanna be a doctor and you enjoy that, cool. But she had a sort of moment of realization, which was that the people around her were working crazy hours, not seeing family, not doing having a social life, anything. And what they were doing is they were unhappy. And they were working longer hours to get more money to spend on things to make them happier. But instead of earning a ridiculous amount of money in a way that you hate or don't enjoy, and then using that money to make you feel less shit. It's like basically, what's a good metaphor for this? It's like literally, um, like you, you're, let's say you're going onto a treadmill and let's say like as a mirror, as an episode of Dark Mirror, when you run 20 miles a day on a treadmill, you get some money and you use that money and spend it on caffeine and other indulgences to make you feel less tired and unhappy. If you have an option, <laughs> have you considered not working ridiculously long hours? Because yes, you'll get less money, but if you are using that money to just try and make yourself happier again, could you try something else that doesn't make you unhappy for the sake of getting money to make yourself happier? Do you see what I mean? So I think, yeah, just don't accept things at face value because they were done that way or they are done that way. And to be honest, a lot of startups wouldn't exist if people had said, oh no, but this is how things work. Challenge things both in your business or professional lives, whether it be challenging the status quo, challenging a business idea or challenging a usual business model, but also use that when you're looking inwards and challenge why you think in few certain ways and what's important to you. And just don't make it a secondary thing where you're going to think about it someday when you're washing the dishes. Set aside time to like discrete bits of time to consider why. Awesome. Thank you very much, Isa. It was a pleasure speaking a pleasure. to you today. So I think we've uh, learned a lot about, you know, what kind of skills it needs to be an entrepreneur, uh, what the kind of questions one should ask uh, oneself and that, in fact, really, you can start a business without quitting your job first. <laughs> Just do it in parallel. So thank you very much um, and have a good evening then. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a wonderful day. It was really fun to talk to you. Um, and yeah, um, thank you for having me. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Christian. Thank you for having Bye. me. Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.